from the beginning of Revelation chapter 4 through the end of chapter 9, John has watched visions unfold from a heavenly perspective. But at the start of chapter 10, the apostle sees and hears from the vantage point of earth. Revelation 10, verse 1 through, 11, through chapter 11, verse 13, provides a picture of the church's role and destiny during the final period of world history. This morning we are studying together Revelation 10, verses 1 through 11. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. He was robed in a cloud with a rainbow above his head. His face was like the sun, and his legs were like fiery pillars. He was holding a little scroll which lay open in his hand. He planted his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. And he gave a loud shout like the roar of a lion. When he shouted, the voices of the seven thunders spoke. And when the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven say, seal up what the seven thunders have said. Do not write it down. Then the angel I had seen standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven, and he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and all that is in them, the earth and all that is in it, and the sea and all that is in it, and said, There will be no more delay. But in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished, just as he announced to his servants the prophets. Then the voice that I had heard from heaven spoke to me once more, Go take the scroll that lies open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll. He said to me, Take it and eat it. It will turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth it will be as sweet as honey. I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and ate it. It tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach turned sour. Then I was told, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. Verses 1 through 7 highlight the commissioning spirit for the church's calls. The text opens with John seeing a mighty angel ascribed in a similar fashion to God and to Christ, clothed with a cloud, echoing Revelation 1, verse 7, with a rainbow on his head, resembling Revelation 4, verse 3, his face like the sun and his feet like pillars of fire, mirroring Revelation 1, 15 to 16. That said... In the book of Revelation, the first person of the Trinity is called the Father of our Lord. He is called the God of heaven, the Lord of the earth, the Lord God of the holy prophets, and the Almighty. Additionally, both the Father and the Son are called Alpha and Omega. And the Son of God, among a few other titles, is seven times called Christ as a fulfillment of the hope for the Davidic Messiah. He is called the Lamb 28 times in connection with his victory over our sin. He is called Jesus 14 times, often in connection with his being the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of kings. Yet neither the Father nor the Son are ever referenced as angel, our messenger. But it makes sense that the mighty angel coming down from heaven who holds an inscription that is given to the Father, that is given to the Son, is none other than the third person of the Trinity. In Revelation, he is at times simply called the Spirit, or the seven spirits, or messenger. The fact that the mighty angel's right foot is on the sea and his left foot is on the land affirms this figure's divinity. Based on Joshua 10, verse 24, we should realize how placing one's foot on something equals maintaining sovereignty over it. The mighty angel exercises sovereignty over the earth, identifying his equality with God. 
Yet the function of the Holy Spirit has always been to glorify the Father through the Son. The Apostle John pulls from Zechariah chapter 4, verses 1 through 14, and presenting the seven spirits as a symbol of the Holy Spirit. This is important because John also draws upon that text in his description of the two witnesses that we find in Revelation chapter 11. How is God going to establish a new kingdom on earth? It will not be through worldly power or strength. It will be by the divine spirit who commissions his church. That's what the two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11 represent. These witnesses are revealed to be lampstands in verse 4, the same title assigned to the church in chapter 1, verses 12 and 20. God the Father sits on his throne in heaven. God the Son now sits victoriously at the Father's right hand in heaven. But from the time of Pentecost onward, the Holy Spirit has indwelt and empowered the church on earth. You might say that the body of believers are olive trees anointed with the oil of the Spirit in order to carry forward the faithful witness of Jesus Christ. That has always been what the Holy Spirit commissions the church to do. Richard Bockholm says, The church does not exist for itself, but in order to participate in the coming of God's universal kingdom. The victory of the Messiah has already won the decisive eschatological event, but it cannot have reached its goal until all evil is abolished from God's world. All nations are gathered into the Messiah's kingdom. This is indeed a Jewish apocalyptic perspective on the Christian salvation event. You see, I think the church on earth is necessary for ushering in the millennial kingdom. The seventh trumpet will not sound until the full number of martyrs amid the church that remains during the great tribulation are complete. In Revelation 10 verse 4, John is told not to write down what the seven thunders spoke. This is a mystery that no biblical scholar can peer into, nor are we meant to do so. But I believe the thunderous sounds should draw our attention to Psalm chapter 29, where the voice of the Lord thunders in his creation seven times. God's people can know from that psalm the way the Lord sits enthroned over the flood, the way that his glory awaits his church, no matter what it might face. When John's attention then returns to the mighty angel, the messenger raises his hand to heaven so as to swear that the period of delay is now over. Daniel 12, verse 7 supplies the interpretive background for this section highlighted in Revelation 11, verse 3. In that Daniel text, a man clothed in linen raises up both hands toward heaven and swears by him who lives forever that the end shall come in a time, two times, and a half a time, when the power of the holy people has finally been broken. Full restraint for the Antichrist is removed. The period of the end is set into motion. Verses 8 through 11 then reveal the Christian's charge as part of the church's cause. Biblical faith insists that God has spoken through his son. Hebrews 1 Verses 1 through 3 tells us, In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times in various ways. 
But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. We must listen to the word. We must believe and respond to the Son. And we must witness to what we know is true. The Lamb of God slain for our sin. We testify to that truth, even if the testimony cost us our lives as well. Bachum goes on to say, the theme of witness is connected with Revelation's dominant concern with truth and falsehood. The world is kind of a courtroom in which the issue of who is the true God is being decided. In this judicial contest, Jesus and his followers bear witness to the truth. This truth to which we bear witness is both sweet and bitter. Oh, how sweet the good news of the gospel is. The psalmist declares in Psalm 34, verse 8, Taste and see the Lord is good. Blessed is him who finds refuge in the Lord. There is nothing sweeter than to realize we can take refuge from our sin through the broken body and shed blood of Jesus. We taste this sweetness. We visualize that refuge whenever we come together as the body of believers to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Even so, a bitterness follows the sweetness of the gospel on two accounts. For one, God redeems his church in order to prophesy to the nations. As Christians, we should want for all to believe, and yet how sour it is to know that people continue to reject the message of salvation. What a mournful, bitter thing to know that which awaits those who do not repent. John's experience in verses 9 and 10 resembles the prophet Ezekiel's experience in Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 7 through 3 and verse 8. Ezekiel's congregation was a rebellious house. While the prophet spoke an attractive word to the people of his day, Ezekiel reported, they are not willing to listen to me. Because all the house of Israel are of a hard forehead, they are of a stubborn heart. Nevertheless, here's the hard and fast truth of it. Regardless if people reject the gospel, regardless if they do not hear us over and over again, we're still charged to proclaim it. Eugene Peterson asks, can it mean much that I stutter out God's word in my daily conversational encounters among people who would rather hear almost anything else? Church, by all means, the answer is an emphatic yes. J.C. Ryle says, it's not our job to convert people. It's not our job to save people. It's not our job to convict people. It's not our job to convince people. It's simply our job to tell people. Amen. The convincing, convicting, converting, and saving is the work of the Holy Spirit. That's right. Because once again, it's the Holy Spirit who commissions Christ's church to our cause. Our cause is to make Jesus known. Second, 
It is better to know what Christians have endured, do endure, and will yet endure for their witness of Jesus. The scroll that John eats is sweet because the seventh angel will soon blow his trumpet. The mystery of God will be accomplished. But it also turns the stomach sour to know that the martyrdom of the church must come first. No biblical witness can exempt him or herself from the prospect of such bitterness. Jesus says in John 15, verse 20, as they have persecuted me, so they will persecute you. The prophet Jeremiah says in chapter 20, verses 8 and 9, whenever I speak, I cry out proclaiming violence, destruction, so the word of the Lord has brought me insult and reproach all day long. And I love this verse so much. But if I say, I will not mention his word or speak any more in his name, his word is yet a fire in my heart, a fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. So it is that Revelation 10 verse 11 tells us you must again prophesy. The Christian's witness enjoined in the church's cause is never an option. It's not some special assignment given only to preachers. It's not some special assignment given only to those who say, well, I'm naturally well-spoken. It's an assignment given to every Christian. Neither does John say, but Lord, I've put in my time. I've paid my dues. I've been through this bitterness again and again. God, I'm tired. It's someone else's turn. Oh, the Holy Spirit does not give any Christian such an option as that. For as long as we have breath, we praise the Lord. For as long as we have breath, we share the good news of Christ to the world again and again and again. There is no retirement from the church's cause. None. The story is told of a man who lived in Zimbabwe, Africa about a century ago. He was coerced by his tribe or some outside group to renounce his faith in Jesus Christ. This, however, is what he wrote in response. It is called the Creed for the Fellowship of the Unashamed. It's a statement that's been popularized on YouTube. It is one that I believe should inspire the kind of boldness that characterizes all Christians to the commitment of the church's cause. I will say it again. We have one cause. We have one mission. It is to make Jesus Christ known. We best not confuse our cause, our purpose, with anything else. Here are the words. I am part of the fellowship of the unashamed. I have Holy Spirit power. The die has been cast. I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I am a disciple of his. I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secure. I'm finished with low living, sight walking, small planning, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tame visions, worldly talking, cheap giving, and dwarfed goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, applause, or popularity. I don't have to be right. 
I don't have to be first or tops, recognized, praised, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by faith, lean on His presence, walk by patience, am uplifted by prayer, and labor by the Spirit's power. My pace is set, my gait is fast, my goal is heaven. My road is narrow, my way rough, my companions few. My guide is reliable, my mission is clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, detoured, lured away, turned back, deluded, or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of the adversary, negotiate at the table of the enemy, pander at the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I won't give up, shut up, let up, until I've stayed up, stored up, prayed up, paid up, preached up for the cause of Jesus Christ. I am a disciple of His. I must go till He comes, give till I drop, preach till all know, and work till He stops me. And when He comes for His own, oh, when He comes for His own, He will have no problem recognizing me. My banner will be clear. I'm part of the fellowship of the unashamed. <laughs> In the first half of Revelation chapter 11, which Bob Ridlon will preach next Sunday, John will go on to give a clear glimpse of those who remain part of the fellowship of the unashamed during the most perilous times for Christ's church. Martyrdom of gospel bearers under the direction of the Antichrist will run rampant. But when the blood of the last martyr in God's sovereign plan has been shed, the seventh trumpet will sound. And Jesus will have no problem recognizing who are his. Will you be counted? among the fellowship of the unashamed. Remember, the open book of Revelation 10, verse 6, comes with this announcement. There will be no more delay. The revelation will be completed. The witness of the church, commissioned by the Spirit, implores you to heed the message of the gospel right now. It requires an immediate response because the day of the Lord is at hand. Today is the day of salvation. Procrastination is the folly of all follies. As Eugene Peterson says, we live in an intense, eternal now. Because when Christ comes, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, he is Lord. Best you do it before he comes. Pray with me. Lord, there are times that I get caught up in all the things that I have to do that I don't take the time to talk to people about the thing that I'm supposed to do. Oh, Christ. Use your church. Oh, Spirit, commission your church. Convict your church. Compel your church. We don't have to say it all right. We just have to say it. Jesus, save me from my sin. Won't you give your life to Christ as well? And then it's up to the Holy Spirit 
to remove the scales from the eyes, to unburden the heart. But how will they know if we don't tell them? How will they believe if we don't go? Empower your church today. Spirit of God, I pray. In the name and for the glory of Jesus Christ, my Lord. Amen.